It's been so long. <laughs> oh, um, you guys want to grab? I got sheets on the back on the back table or the back chair back there. You guys want to pass those out for me? Ben, Charles, Jackson, Emily, Noah. I don't care. Charlie. <laughs> if you get those passed out, you haven't had a sheet in like a month and a half. So here you welcome back, right? So uh, they're right here, Charles. Yeah, right on that back chair. Uh, so if you'd like a sheet, they'll bring those around uh, for you. I'm having you turn to two passages while they're, while they're uh, doing that. Genesis 18 and then Jeremiah 32. Genesis 18, Jeremiah 32. So if you want to find your, your places there while they're coming around. Eddie, Genesis, that's the first book. Just, just to help your brother, all right? All right? That's the Old Testament. First, very first one, all right? Genesis 18 and Jeremiah 32. Again, as normal, if you don't have a Bible with you tonight, that's okay. We will have that up here on the screen here for you. But Amen. Your dad, my dad gave you a sheet? Well, bless his soul. Man, he's all right. We should keep him around. We should keep him around. Amen. His, did, his didn't match? I am disappointed. I didn't watch that one. I'll have to. No alliteration. I'm going to have to get after him. He's the one that taught me alliteration. Well, I, not solely, but uh, he is a master alliterator. And uh, if you ever, of course, you only heard him a couple times, but if you sat under his ministry for many years, he'd say a word and you'd be like, huh? And it was a word that meant a different word, but it had to match letters. And so it was a word you didn't know what it, what it meant. But uh, he, was, he was pretty good at that. So, amen. All right. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, yes. If you're a sign, sign, sign language. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you got to change it on. You got to change it on the fly, man. <laughs> they don't know that it's alliterated, right? I mean, they're. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> All right. Everybody get an outline that wants one. We good? All right. Everybody find Genesis 18. All right. Let's stand together. Well, y'all stand. <laughs> Just in the habit of saying it. I'll sit. And uh, we'll look at Genesis 18 and verse number 14. And then, like I say, we'll turn to Jeremiah 32 right after that. Scripture says this, Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. We see the context of that verse. Uh, Abraham and Sarah, that child that was promised in really an impossible age group to have children. Uh, and uh, the starts with that verse is anything too hard from the Lord. Go to Jeremiah chapter 32 and look at verse uh, 17. Jeremiah says this, All Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. We get the question asked in Genesis more than one place in Scripture, but in Jeremiah 32 we get the answer. Is anything too hard for the Lord? I think we can, uh, uh, without hesitation or reservation, say tonight, no. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. And so as we look at that tonight, let's uh, pray, and then we'll jump right into the message this evening. Father, we love you tonight. We thank you for your goodness, your blessing. Uh, thank you for the time we've had to sing and praise your name. Thank you for the missionary letter, Lord, and uh, our missionaries in Chile, Lord. We pray that you'll continue to bless their work, uh, Lord, even as they're still dealing with some of the ramifications from COVID. I'm sure we pray that you'll heal those people up, and may they continue to serve you, Lord, and see churches started and lives changed and people saved. Uh, we ask you now tonight as we open your word for the next few minutes that you'll bless the preaching of your word. May it be helpful to us. May it remind us of some, really some basic thoughts, uh, but remind us of how great of a God we serve this evening, I pray. We thank you again for all you do and what you'll continue to do in our midst. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated this morning, this evening. Still getting my sense. It's, it's, the, it's all the drugs I took after church to get me here tonight. There's still, uh, no, I'm kidding, I didn't have to take any. I'm thankful for that. But uh, I want to ask you a question tonight, and I know what your answer is going to be, but I'm going to ask it anyways, all right? Do you believe that nothing is too hard for the Lord? Yeah, we, we, we believe that. We say that. Uh, if someone were to ask, we'd, we'd emphatically say, no, nothing is too hard for the Lord. I ask this question for a reason because I find myself... And if you're honest with yourself, there are probably times in your life you find yourself this way. I say, nothing is too hard for the Lord. 
But then I go through tough times or times of uncertainty and I'm wringing my hands like God doesn't know what he's doing. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. Right? Oh, he can do anything. Oh, is he going to come through? Oh, he can do anything, but you don't understand how, how my finances are right now. Oh, he can do anything, but my health. He can do anything, but you fill in the blank, right? And we find ourselves many times in difficult times or times of uncertainty where we begin to almost question whether or not we really believe that nothing is too hard for the Lord. Uh, let, let me just encourage us as Christians tonight. Jeremiah very powerfully says, there is nothing too hard for thee. I want to encourage us as a church tonight uh, to, to realize that God can take care of every situation. It doesn't matter what you find yourself in, how difficult it is, if it's 50 times harder than the person sitting next to you. We serve the God of gods, the creator of the universe, uh, Jehovah Jireh, amen? Uh, the, the, the father who's never let his children down yet, never will. Uh, and so tonight, just be encouraged in that fact. As we ask the question, is nothing too hard for the Lord? We can say yes. I want to encourage us to live like we believe nothing is too hard for the Lord. That's my encouragement tonight. Uh, we're going to start a series next Sunday night. Uh, I'll just give you a little teaser this evening, and it was on the screen this morning and the, maybe this afternoon during, during announcements and things like that, but uh, we're going to start a series next Sunday night called Mission Impossible, and we're going to go through some of the ministry of Jesus Christ, and we're going to watch how he took impossible situations that men, that scientists, that doctors, that lawyers would say, there's no way, there's no hope for that person, and God does something that nobody else could do. That's, how, that's what God does. He specializes in the hard things. And so that's where we're going to be next, next week. So I want to kind of lead up to that fact tonight with this message and just encourage us to remember tonight, nothing is too hard for our Lord. I'm going to give you four thoughts tonight, uh, and then I'll pray. We'll go home. If the ice cream shop was open, we'd go there. But it's closed on Sunday, so go on Monday. Amen? <laughs> Amen. My wife, uh, we were talking yesterday, and uh, I said, uh, I'd really like to go get some ice cream. I don't get out of the house much. That's Saturday morning, I got to eat breakfast with the men. That was the best day of my life in the last two weeks. I'm just going to be honest with you. I got out of the house. I got to talk to people. It was great. The dogs weren't on me. I wasn't watching TV. I wasn't reading. I got out of my house. Uh, I didn't clean up very much. Sorry, guys. But uh, uh, I showed up, <laughs> and it was great. But, but we, I talked to my wife. I said, I'd like to go get some ice cream. And I want a, I want a banana blueberry uh, ice cream in a chocolate-coated waffle cone. Amen? Doesn't that sound good? That sounds fantastic. And, I, and she was like, you know what? I'd like to try it too. She said, we'll go. And I said, all right. I sat there for about a half an hour. I said, we're going to go get ice cream? Yeah, give me a minute. I'm finishing something. Okay. About an hour passed. I said, are we going to go get ice cream? I just don't feel like it. And I felt like my heart, Donna, had been ripped right out of my chest. I said, you can't tell me we're going to go get ice cream and then pull the carpet out from under me. It's not fair. <laughs> and, and, and boy, it bothered me. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Call you. <laughs> Terry, come pick me up and get ice cream. Amen. I know I had a whole church list on my desk right beside me. I should have called somebody. Take me for ice cream, please. <laughs> I don't know why I'm telling you that story, but what it had to do with anything. But <laughs> Rabbit trail from something. It's, something started. I just don't know what it was. <laughs> God would have taken me to get ice cream. That's what it was. <laughs> Nothing's too hard for the Lord. <laughs> Anyways, so I want to give you four quick things. That's what, I, that's what it was. I said, then we'll go get ice cream. Four quick things, we'll get ice cream. There we go. Okay, I got it now. It wasn't a total rabbit trail. Whew, I was getting worried there. All right, number one. Number one. At least I'm starting with number one, right? Number one, there is no promise too hard for God to fulfill. There is no promise too hard for God to fulfill. Numbers chapter 23 and verse number 19, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. And he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? You know, isn't it nice to know tonight that we serve a God that number one, cannot lie, number one, does not change, and number two, when he says something, he does it. We've all been guilty at some point in our lives of making a promise and probably uh, going back on that, not being able to fulfill it, whether intentionally or unintentionally. Uh, we've had somebody do that to us as well. We've had that disappointment, kind of like the ice cream that was promised yesterday and I didn't get, all right? We, we, we do that. We're human. But the, the good thing about our God is this, and nothing being too hard for him, any promise he's ever made, 
it's never too hard for him to fulfill. And by the way, if you read scripture and read some of the promises of God, some of those are pretty, pretty, pretty bold. Think about this one. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Do you realize that promise is not to a select group of people? That promise is not to you know, people who live in the state of Arizona or people who go to this particular church. That's a, that's a, that's a across-the-board promise given to his children. How can he do that for all of his children all across the world at the same time? He's God. He's God. There is no promise too hard for him to fulfill. I thought about the promises of God as I was preparing this. And I thought, first of all, about this. The promises of God are sure. They're sure. You can take them to the bank. When God says it, God means it. When God promises it, God will deliver. And I'm thankful that his promises are sure, aren't you? They're not wishy-washy. You can't look and say, well, this one was and didn't, didn't come through. And this one, I don't know. No, if he said it, it's going to happen. That's the promises of God. They're sure. Somebody made this statement once. I don't know who to give credit to. And I'll just start taking credit for these myself, right? I came up with this. But they're, 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 so, they're so good, you know it wasn't me. So I'll just be honest, all right? He said this. God sometimes says things in the Bible that he did not say directly to me. But God never uttered one word in the Bible that he didn't say for me. Isn't that good? Isn't that good? You know, you can see promises in Scripture that he promised to Israel. And you say, well, I'm not from Israel. Well, that's not for me. But it may not be directly to you, but aren't you thankful that the promises of God are still for you? That's the, that's the goodness of our God. No promise is too big or too hard for him to fulfill. His promises are sure. Never let her be there. His promises are like the stars. The darker the night, the brighter they shine. You ever, you ever been outside and just watch the stars? Isn't that gorgeous? You, you realize that, that, that that's, that's our heavenly creator universe, of the universe. That's God that, that did all that. You know, the Bible says he spans the universe with his hand. That's a mighty large God, amen? <laughs> and we don't even know. We, we, we've just scratched the surface of what the universe is really like. And you look at those stars and how beautiful they are and, and just how, how gorgeous you think. Thank God for this, for this night. But you notice as darker it gets, the brighter those stars shine. You realize that's many times true about the promises of God. When we're at our worst, we're at our wit's end, we're thinking, man, I don't know how I'm going to make it. All of a sudden, we, we pull a promise of God from Scripture and we think, wow, that helps me right now. may not have even thought about it two weeks ago, but today it helps me and it shines in my life. Uh, Romans chapter 15 and verse number 4 says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we might through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Aren't you thankful for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ? That hope is part of one of his promises. 1 Corinthians 10, 11 says this, Now all these things happen unto them for in samples or examples. Uh, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. I love Titus 1, 2. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Isn't that awesome? You realize that God has promised to his children eternal life, and that was a promise guaranteed to us before we were even thought about? Before the world was even designed, God had promised us eternal life. Aren't you thankful for that? Amen. I am. I'm thankful for his promises. How about this? And we like these, right? Philippians, Philippians 4 is great. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Uh, you've got that promise that's been given to us. And by the way, when you're facing difficult times, we pull this one out and we need it. And we use it and say, hey, I can do this. I can make it. I can go another day. I can trust him a little bit more. Uh, the, the other one, verse 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. That's a promise of God. And, and we claim that one quite often, don't we? And, and boy, when, we, when we're claiming it, it's usually when it's dark times in our life. Thank God for the promises of God. Uh, they're like the stars. Let me get this last thought here. The promises of God are just as sure today. We look at some of these promises of God, and uh, I'll read you this verse here real quick, Luke eleven thirteen. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? You know, you think about some of the promises of God as you read Scripture. And again, some not made directly to me, but all for me. And you think about some of them, and we're tempted to say this. Well, that only applied to Israel. Or, well, that only applied to the Old Testament people. Or, well, even the New Testament was so long ago. That, you, know, that, you realize today we serve the exact same God that they served in Scripture? The exact same God who didn't change then hasn't changed now. 
He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the promises that he gave them that we can apply today are still just as sure as they were when he delivered them to them in Scripture. That's our God. There is no promise too hard for God to fulfill. Number two. Number two. There is no prayer too hard for God to answer. There is no prayer too hard for God to answer. You ever, you ever sat in, oh boy, Miss Jean, is that you? I got to tell you this story. Bring me back here, okay? Y'all remember where I'm at? Bring me back here, okay? I uh, was visiting Brother Ron um, the week before he passed, somewhere in that time frame. And I was visiting, I spent some time, we, we prayed a little bit, sang a little bit, cried a little bit. I cried mostly, and uh, <laughs> I'm just being honest. And uh, on my way out, Miss Jean said, Pastor, I got something for you. And I said, what are you giving for me? And she said, I've got a pizza for you. A bacon pizza. Oh, hallelujah. Right? And I said, what are you giving me a pizza for? And she said, Pastor, I know my phone rings in church more than anybody else's, so I'm giving you a pizza. <laughs> I said, praise God, let it keep ringing, sister, amen? <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> where was I? There is no prayer too hard for God to answer. Have you ever sat down and realized, man, I've got a, I've got a big need? I've got a big request. It may not, may not even be personal, maybe it is, but maybe it's for somebody in my family. Maybe it's a loved one, maybe it's a coworker. but it's a serious thing. And we think, man, I'm going to take it to the Lord in prayer. But deep down in the back of our mind, we think, and this is really big. I'm not sure he can handle it. It's really big. So I'm just going to pray. But you know, whatever happens, happens. Huh? We're guilty of that many times. I'm going to go ahead and ask because I'm supposed to. But we don't really trust that he's going to answer. You remember, you remember I, 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 I tell this a lot because it's just, so, it's just so fitting for my life. Probably yours as well. But you remember, remember when Peter was in prison? And the church was gathered in the house praying? And... and God, God releases him from prison. You remember? He comes. Remember the little servant girl answers? She's like, oh, it's Peter. She doesn't open the door for him. You know, she just says, oh, it's Peter. Her parents taught her right. right? Don't open the door. But he wasn't a stranger. But uh, it, it's Peter. Right? And she goes back and she tells him, Peter's at the door. What do they say? <laughs> He's in prison. Right? And then, of course, they go. They find out it is him. And they're amazed that he's there. Why are we amazed when God answers prayer? Huh? Yeah. When we pray, we ought to just say, and God, by the way, thank you for answering because I know you're going to. But sometimes we get stuck in that. This is a big request. Well, I'm thankful he's a big God. Amen? I'm thankful he can hear every request given to him at every moment of the day, work in everybody's life, do, answer everybody. I'm thankful that he's able to do that. I've never had to stand in line to get a hold of God. Aren't you thankful for that? Uh, there's no prayer too hard for God to answer. Uh, somebody else said this. I won't take credit. When God is going to do something wonderful, he starts with a difficulty. When God is going to do something very wonderful and miraculous, he starts with an impossibility. Hmm? You've been in a time in your life you looked at a situation and said, this, this is impossible. This is impossible. By the way, when we get into Mission Impossible here next week, that's exactly what we're going to see. We're going to see situations in life where people looked at their life and said, there is no hope. This is impossible. Do you realize that's when God truly wants to step in and shine? And God truly wants to step in and answer prayer. And God wants to do something miraculous in our impossible situations. And here's the great thing. He has the ability to do that. There's no prayer too hard for God to answer. Look at a couple of thoughts I put down. Just, just kind of a question here. We'll ask a couple of questions. When's the last time God answered a specific prayer for you? I'm not, I'm not talking about God bless the missionaries because they're blessed, right? So that, you can't say, well, God answered my prayer. That doesn't count. I'm not talking about I'm talking about a specific prayer. You had a very, very specific need, and you put it in God's hands, and God answered. Hmm? I don't want you to raise your hand or anything, but when's the last time? When's the last time? Uh, one of these days, where's Mona? She's here somewhere. Oh, she's over here. You always sit over here at the evenings. I'm sorry. You sit over there in the morning. You sit over there in the evenings. Uh, Mona, one of these days, she's, she's after me to tell the, uh, the events that led up to us actually coming here to Calvary to be your pastor. And, and I'll tell you what one of them was, okay? <laughs> one of them was very specific answers to prayer. Without those answers to prayer, 
me sitting in this wheelchair probably wouldn't be happening today, all right? Uh, we may not be here. I may be on the beach in Florida, amen? Now it's humid there. But uh, <laughs> very specific answers to prayer. When's the last time God answered a specific prayer for you? I don't want you, again, I don't want you to testify, raise your hand or anything tonight, but, you know, some Christians have to look back months and even years. If we are walking in the light as he is in the light, and we have fellowship one with another, amen, we ought to be able to look very recently and say, oh, yeah, God just worked in my life just the other day. Just the other day God did this, and there's no other person who could have done it. This had to be God. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. We shouldn't have to go back very far to see that God has answered our prayer. When's the last time? Secondly, I'll ask this question. Have we learned to claim the promises of, uh, 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 of, of prayer, the, the prayer promises of God? Jeremiah 33, 3, a very popular verse, probably many of you know it. Call unto me, I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. When's the last time we, we, and don't take this the wrong way, but when's the last time we called God on the carpet and said, God, you promised this, I'm bringing it to you, I'm expecting you to answer it, thank you. Huh? Claim the prayer promises. You know, they're given to us all through Scripture. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Ask in my will, and it shall be done unto you. We see all kinds of prayer promises. We've been on it Wednesday nights for seven or eight weeks, right? We, we, we see those prayer promises, but when's the last time I actually, in my prayer life, claimed them instead of thinking, well, this is a big request. I'm not sure God can do it. There is no prayer that God cannot answer. Now, I will, I will specify and say this. He may not answer it the way you want him to, okay? And you may have to search to understand the answer that he provided, but he does answer. He does answer. Uh, he, there is no prayer too hard for him to answer. I know you think, well, you don't know. You don't know my cousin, Roger. If that guy could get saved, I don't know. You just don't know him. No, you know what God does? And I see in Scripture some very impossible situations of unsaved people that God touched. Amen? Amen? There is no prayer too hard for God to answer. There is no promise too hard for Him to fulfill. Let me give you number three. Number three, there is no problem too hard for God to solve. There is no problem too hard for God to solve. You ever, uh, you ever have problems? Anybody not have problems? <laughs> if so, I want to know your secret, right? <laughs> we all have problems. We all face difficult times. We all go through valleys. We, we all have burdens. and I get that. But here's the encouraging thing, Christian, tonight. There is no problem, whether it's emotional, spiritual, mental, physical, financial. You can fill in any blank you want. There is no problem too hard for God to solve. He can meet every need. He can provide for every situation. He can relieve every burden. He can answer every request. No problem too hard for God to solve. Everyone gets into times of difficulties. You realize the Christian is not exempt from that? We don't get saved and say, all right, my life's going to be easy now. The reality is, I think your life becomes a little bit harder. Because now the devil's really gunning for you. And the devil's crowd's gunning for you. And your, fight's go your flesh is going to fight even more. And so there, there are no, I'm not going to have any problems because I'm saved. No, we're not exempt. It rains on the just and the unjust. Amen? Think about Scripture. Abraham had difficulties. Moses had difficulties. Noah had difficulties. Gideon had difficulties. The man after God's own heart, David, had difficulties. The Hebrew children had difficulties. Daniel had difficulties. Peter had difficulties. Paul had difficulties. The disciples had difficulties. Nobody was exempt from it. Jesus himself had difficulties. Expect it. It's going to come. The, the encouraging thing is you say, Pastor, that's not very encouraging tonight. The encouraging thing is this. No matter what difficulty comes, we've got the problem solver. He can handle any situation. Any Christian who attempts things for God is going to face times of crisis in their life. It's just part of reality. But no problem is too great for God to solve. Uh, you know, uh, somebody said this one time as well, and, and I maybe should have said it under the first point. Uh, you, you can't break God's promises by leaning on them. <laughs> we sing that song, leaning, leaning, leaning on, I don't know the words anymore, <laughs> leaning on his everlasting arms, right? You can't break his promises by leaning on him. 
He promises to be with his children. He promises to deliver us. He promises to fight our battles for us on our behalf. Amen? And we see him live up to that in Scripture time and time and time again. There is no problem too hard for God to solve. God did not promise you an easy voyage, but he did promise you a safe arrival. You remember, you remember, the, uh, you remember the disciples when they got on that boat and he said, we're going to the other side? Remember, he was leaving the crowd. They were going to the land of the Gadareans where he met the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the maniac of Gadara, remember? And they get on that boat, and there's that storm that comes, remember? And, and, and Jesus, here's the thing. The disciples fretted. The disciples worried. The disciples feared for their life. And, and Jesus had already told them, we're going to the other side. You see the lack of faith even on the disciples' parts? We're guilty of it sometimes. God's not promising an easy street. But it does promise this, I'll walk through the valley of the shadow of death with you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I'll fight on your behalf. I'll be your shield, your sword, and your buckler. I'll be your strong tower. He promises us those things. No problem too big for God to solve. Psalm 37 says this, verse 3 through 5. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. What a great, what a great scripture to claim in times of difficulty. Amen? If I'll trust him, if I'll let him lead the way he wants to lead, if I'll commit my way to him, and I'll trust his, his, his all-powerful presence and work in my life, he'll bring it to pass. He'll bring it to pass. Uh, everyone goes through difficulties. I'll say this. I didn't put it up there. There's a letter B, isn't there? It's not on the screen here for you, so let me say it for you. Again, any Christian who attempts something for God is going to face difficulty. We see that in letter A. Letter B is this. It's how we handle the difficulties that shows what we're made of. We've probably been on both sides of the coin, every one of us in our life. We went through a difficult time, and we were like, oh, this isn't fair. Oh, God, why me? My situation is so difficult. I'm going to complain. And, blah, blah, blah. and then we probably been on times where we said, hey, God's doing something. God is working, I'm going to trust him and let him work. We've probably been on both sides of that equation, right, in our lives, as we grow spiritually. When are we more blessed? When do we grow more? When we're complaining or when we're saying, hey, I'm going to trust God and let him do his work? See, you can't control the situations God puts you in. You can't control the difficulties he gives you. You can't control many things in life that happen to you. But you can control your attitude and how you respond in the situations he puts you in. I'm guilty. I'm not even going to lie and say I'm not. I'm guilty of saying, this isn't fair, God. Why me? Oh, you know. Why couldn't this happen to somebody else? Why? Look, look. Huh? And God says, man, if you would just trust me, and if your attitude wouldn't stink so much, you might see a blessing wrapped up in all of this. How do I respond? He can handle any difficulty. But let me tell you something. I really enjoy how he handles it more when my attitude is right in the process. Amen? And when I know he's working, when I know he's blessing, when I know he's got a plan, he has a plan. You realize that sometimes those difficulties only happen in my life because he's, he's shaping me, he's molding me, he's knocking off the rough edges, he's, he's like the potter in the clay, right? And he's making me what he wants me to be. He's, he's knocking some dross off to make me into what he wants me to be. No difficulty, no problem too hard for God, no prayer too hard for God, no promise too hard for God. Let me get this last thing, number four. Number four. There's no place God cannot send a revival. No place God cannot send a revival. I wish I had a dollar for every time I have heard lately. Is God done with America? Do we have a chance? Can our nation survive? Can our nation come back to God? Is there any hope for our country, preacher? My answer usually is this. As long as God is on the throne... There's hope for our country. As long as God is on the throne, revival is possible. I do believe, and I mentioned a little bit this morning, I do believe that there's going to come a time in our churches where we're going to be put to the ultimate test. And we think we had it bad when we got shut down for COVID. We had it bad when they were making laws against the church to be, couldn't meet. We thought we had it bad then. I think the, the pressure is going to hit us eventually down the road, and we're going to have to make a definitive statement. Are we going to stand for Christ or are we going to fold? Are we going to live for God or are we going to give in to the pressure? Uh, here's the thing. Even in the midst of troubles and trials and problems and, and negativity and wickedness and sin and all that's abounding today, God can still bring revival. 
let me tell you real quick, okay? Let me tell you why right now we're not experiencing, but we could be. Laid out for us in Second Chronicles 7.14. If my people, which are called by my name, I may have put it up here for you, they did, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their stinking, wicked, rotten, filthy ways. I'm adding a little bit, sorry. Then, then, this is a word that means after. After they do, I will. See, it's a promise, but there's a stipulation. Then will I hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. See, the the solution for America's experience revival, it's not found in the White House in Washington, D.C., It's not found in any of the political arenas that are out there today. It's not found in in the schools. It's not found in the government. It's not found in society. It's found in Jesus Christ. That's the hope. And it's found in his people getting really and truly right with God to experience revival. You know, if you think about it, really, you know what's holding back revival? Revival. Me, you, because here's the thing, and I'm going to give you four thoughts that kind of sum this up here, but for me to do what that verse says, that's to totally surrender my heart to God, to totally get right with Him in every area, to let Him have full control. Number one, it's hard to do, but number two, it's scary because then God might actually do something with me. And many people will not take this step because they're afraid of what God might do. Folks, if we want to truly pray for our country, we want to truly beg God to send revival, it's going to start right here. It's going to start in our lives. It's going to start in the church. It's time, uh, Scripture says, that judgment begins in the house of the Lord. We got to quit faking things. We got to quit living in sin. We got to quit saying, well, I can get by with this. I can be mediocre. I can be complacent. And we got to get serious for God. Years ago, there was... A revival that took place called the Great Welsh Revival. And they, they, they studied that revival that took place as it began and took, took place and began to grow and begin to flourish. And thousands of people got saved. Thousands of people got right. Lives were changed. So many people were affected through this. And they summed up four things that they did to get that revival going, started, and continuing. And I want to give you these four things, okay? Because if God's going to send a revival, he can do it anywhere. By the way, he did it in Nineveh. Amen? He did it in Nineveh. Uh, he did it multiple times for Israel. Okay? He can do it here. But I think there's some things involved that we have to be a part of. And if we can say, well, he can't send revival here because he has it. i, I got to look at me first, okay? It's got to start here. So, so what are the things that we can do that the great Welsh revival, those folks did, that, that they saw extreme revival? First of all, yeah. condemn sin in ourselves. Condemn sin in ourselves. I mentioned David this morning. And David's been a topic of study for months in my life and our teens. And uh, I love David. I love the storyline of David. You might get a couple months of David in here one of these days. But um, just, just an amazing man of God. A man after God's own heart. But we also know David had some issues. David wasn't perfect. David fell. And David fell hard. David did some things. There ain't a person in this room. Would ever think of doing. Well, I mean, I no, I'm just kidding. The murder, that whole murder thing. I thought about, but no, I'm kidding. David's done some things, and you rack them up with each other, and you're like, what? How is he a man after God's own heart? It's like I mentioned in Psalm 51, because David realized his sin, acknowledged his sin, called it what it was. It was sin. See, see, see. When I disobey God, it's not an indiscretion. It's not a, oops, I made a mistake. It's sin. And the sooner, and I know this is a Sunday night crowd, and maybe you think, well, you should be preaching this on a Sunday morning. There are more sinners than we are. I don't care what service it is. We need to get back to calling sin, sin. Our country doesn't acknowledge it as sin, and many churches have gone that route of not acknowledging it as sin anymore. But sometimes we as individuals feel like, well, I can just call it an oops. Made an oopsie. No, I sinned. It's iniquity. It's a transgression against God. Psalm 139 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. By the way, he does. And I can hide my sin from everybody in this room. I can't hide it from God. 
Try me, he says. Know my thoughts. You know, isn't that scary? Isn't that scary? God knows our thoughts. Before we say, do, act in any way, he already knows what's going on up here. And sometimes my thoughts are sinful. And God knows that. Know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way of everlasting. The psalmist just says, hey, listen. God, you know. I'm wicked before you. Search me. Show me. Reveal if I haven't confessed it. Show it to me, God. I want to live in the proper way. Folks, if we want to, if we want to experience revival that's not too hard for God to provide, it, it's not going to come by having some preacher in here for a week of meetings and him preaching fiery sermons that fire us up. Because you know what? When he leaves, what happens? We go back to our comfy spot. We do. We do. This is not about a, a service. It's not about a week long. It's not about a preacher. This is about us getting ourselves thoroughly right with the Lord. Uh, condemn sin in myself. Secondly, letter B, completely obey God in every matter. I know this can be difficult. God ever asked you to do something and you looked at it and said, what? Do what, Lord? You sure you're talking to the right person, God? That's not for me. That's not my, that's not my character, characteristic. That's not how... If I, want to, if I want to experience revival and pray for revival... I, I've got to get sin right first. And then I've got to obey him. And whatever he asks me to do. Thy word have I hid in my heart. Psalm 119 says. That I might not sin against thee. It's time that we got back. Not just to call and sin sin. But we got back to studying his word. And applying his word. And doing his word. See you know, this, this whole thought of. Well I'm a Christian. So I've got to read his word every day. Let me. Okay there I'll read that passage for five minutes. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about Thoroughly. Soaking ourselves in the word of God. Having a relationship so sweet with that book that uh, when, when somebody comes in and says, Hey, I need you. I, I got to finish this chapter for you. You're going to have to wait. God's got something for me in here. Amen. And then applying those truths to our lives. Completely obey God in every matter. You realize when God says go, he means go. When God says give, he means give. When God says wait, he means wait. When God says no or yes, that's what he means. Completely obey God. All to Jesus I surrender, including my selfishness and my ways. I'll surrender them to him. Condemn sin and self. Completely obey God in every matter. Let us see. Have a, com- uh, sorry, I missed a space there. Have a compassionate burden for others. Have a compassionate burden for others. We talked earlier about uh, you know, praying for the lost. Even weeping over the loss. Psalm 83, 18 says this. That men may know that thou, whose name alone is Jehovah, art the most high over all the earth. Do we care about people? I'm the first one to say. I say it often and I'll continue to say it often. Some people are hard to love. Hester back there. <laughs> Difficult. No, I'm kidding. I'm just teasing him. He's easy to love. We know it. Somebody ran through your mind when I said that. I guarantee it. Now, I'm not going to ask you to say who that is in public, okay, because it might be me, and I don't want you to say that. But some people are hard to love. I know that. We're human. We're human. But when we realize that every person has a soul, and that soul will spend eternity in one of two places, Heaven or hell. It motivates me to be full of compassion to say, every person I meet, I want to try to make sure I know where their soul's heading. Now, I may not get to every person, and I may not get through the gospel with every person, but an attempt should be made in my life to be compassionate towards people. Not just their burdens and their hard times, but for their soul. You've got to think about something. If, if the church isn't going to tell people about Christ being the great Jehovah, who's going to? They ain't going to learn that on TV. Hollywood's not teaching them that. Government, government ain't teaching them that. They want you to stay far away from God and depend on them. Right? Who's going who's to tell them if we don't? A compassionate burden for others. I know it's not always easy, especially when it's family. 
Family is some of the, the most difficult people to try to witness. I know that. I have lost family. I know how hard it is. But I still have to try. And I have to have a burden. And that burden relays over to my prayer life we talked about earlier. Have a compassionate burden, brothers. Let me give you this last thing. And again, this goes back to point number two. <laughs> Pray. John 16 says, Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask and ye shall receive. Why? That your joy may be full. You want revival? There's some things I have to do in my life. There's some things I have to do in my life. We see that. But it also involves some prayer. It also involves some prayer. Uh, Lord, send revival to me. By the way, it starts in me. I don't, I don't want to pray, Lord, send revival to my church or to my country or to my state. Send it to me. Uh, and when, once I have it, maybe that'll rub off on somebody. Amen? You ever, you ever been sitting in a room or in a car or in a bus or wherever you may be, and somebody does this? <laughs> I'm watching. I'm watching. I saw five people just yawn after I did that. What happened? It's, it kind of spread, right? You ever, you ever been there in a the room or, or walking in some place, and you looked at somebody, and you just smiled real big? The typical, the typical result is they smile back. Now, it doesn't always happen because you just have some stinkers out there. But the typical result is they smile back at you. And if somebody else might see it and they smile, it's contagious. A, a joyful spirit rubs off on people. Criticism rubs off on people, right? Think about this. When's the last time I had such a burden to be compassionate towards people and to share the gospel and to pray for the lost? Uh, and, and have revival in my life, that when I got that revival, it started rubbing off on people. And they said of me, maybe, I want, I, want, I want some of what he's got. I don't know what it is, but I want it, amen? Revival. Folks, there's nothing too hard for the Lord tonight. I don't know every one of your lives, you know, in great detail this evening. Uh, we all face difficult things, difficult trials. We all have burdens, I know that. But whatever you might be facing tonight, I just want to encourage you. There is nothing too hard for the Lord. Claim a promise. Uh, go to him in prayer. Uh, it, trusting, of course, <laughs> that he'll answer. You got a problem? Take it to him. You know, you know what scripture says? Cast all your care upon him, for he cares for you. All. You know what that word means? I am so smart. It means everything. All means all. Amen? Every, I know. <laughs> I got a little help in the front row. <laughs> all. Cast all your care upon him, your burdens. And, and Christian, tonight, I don't know about you, I sure would like to see revival, wouldn't you? I sure would like to see God do a work one last time before we hear the trumpet. A lot of that depends on us. There's nothing too hard for the Lord. Don't ever forget that, Christian. And as you live your daily life, claim those truths. Remember those principles. And it might just help you get through a difficult time a little easier if we'll remember nothing is too hard for the Lord. Father, Lord, tonight I pray you'll uh, take what has been shared this evening. I pray that you'll use it to encourage us. Lord, challenge us if we need challenged. Correct us if we need corrected. Uh, Lord, if one of those thoughts that we are presented tonight needs to be dealt with in our own hearts and our own lives, help us, Lord, to quickly and swiftly deal with that. Help us, Lord, to uh, realize and claim and then live by that phrase that we believe, there's nothing too hard for the Lord. Continue to work in our hearts and our lives, Lord. Work in our church and our city and our state and even our country. Lord, may we as God's people get thoroughly right with you so that we can ask you and, and, and know that you can bring revival even to our land. May we do our part, Lord, I pray. God, we thank you for uh, the lesson tonight. We thank you for the passage of Scripture that we've been able to look into this evening. We pray again that we'll use them in our lives and help us to grow in our relationship with you. Because of that, we pray. Uh, Father, we ask you tonight now as we prepare to go to our homes, we just ask for safety as we travel. And we ask you to bring us back again uh, on Wednesday, Lord, as we open your word and as we pray and as we study uh, Wednesday evening. We ask you to meet with us and uh, may we look forward to Wednesday's meeting, Lord. May you help us to live for you this week and point people towards the Savior, I pray. And we ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Goodbye. God bless you. Shake a hand or two on your way out, and we will see you on Wednesday.